Thanks, Thanks Peter. For the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dimitri, and also to Sages for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I have the following disclosures, none of which are relevant to this talk. I do, however, have many personal disclosures, which I do think are relevant. Um, so I do have 12 brothers and sisters, and yes, we all come from the same parents. Um, I'm married to a, a busy cardiologist and have high energy young twin boys. I have a cat and two dogs, and surprisingly, it's not the Vizsla that's, that's uh, disruptive, it's the pug. Um, midlife crisis, I thought it would be fun to have two pygmy goats in our backyard uh, in Seattle, but these goats have thought, uh, been adopted by an OR nurse since then. So I think the topic of this talk um, can be given in a multitude of ways. There's a multitude of uh, titles that are applicable. We all have unique challenges when trying to grow our careers. And due to time constraint, I won't get into the title of how to grow your career while finding a spouse or partner. Uh, but I do think we should emphasize how to grow your career while having children. Um, this was a, a study published in 2014 where I think the results were somewhat surprising. It was among female uh, surgeons, and what it showed is that almost a third have issues with fertility, and surprisingly, 23% resort to IVF, which is significantly higher than the national norm at 5%. So when I got married in residency, uh, I obviously didn't know the odds of uh, getting pregnant and the challenges that, that uh, we face as female surgeons. Of, I had it all planned out. You get married during the research years, you get pregnant, have a child, continue on without disruption. And uh, this obviously wasn't the case. Uh, and uh, five failed IVF cycles later and trips from Durham to New York uh, being, you know, really uh, wanting to succeed uh, was challenging and adding hormones and financial costs only add to the baseline stress of being a surgical resident. Here's another study where it's talking about birth trends and factors affecting childbearing in thoracic surgeons. I think it's interesting, so uh, among the thoracic surgeons of uh, females, 70% desired children and only 40% had children, and the majority of them delayed uh, having children due to careers. Um, the uh, resort, resorting to IVF is also pretty high, 28%. Uh, compared to 12%, which is the national mean. Um, it's age averaged. So uh, prior to getting to that slide, I think, I think it's important for our programs to know uh, the increased infertility risks that face our female uh, residents and that we should uh, be more cognizant of this and uh, implement policies to support uh, our female residents having children earlier during their training. This is an article uh, which was published by Dr. Salas, our first speaker. It was in, uh, published in Time Magazine. And so why not just freeze your eggs? Well, I think uh, it's not as simple as that. It involves procedure, a procedure that is not without risks. It's not cheap. It's not covered by insurance. It costs around 15000 plus storage costs. Uh, you may require multiple procedures, which may be necessary to increase your odds of later success. And of course, there's no guarantee that a future IVF cycle using the frozen eggs would be successful. Uh, I applaud Dr. Salas for raising this awareness. I think it's paramount uh, for our younger trainees to be aware of and really emphasize that obviously there is never a good time to get pregnant, freeze your embryos or eggs. So, once you get pregnant, you're also at an increased risk of complications. So from a personal standpoint, I did indeed get pregnant during my second year of fellowship and again uh, fell into the unfavorable statistical category uh, of having complications. Uh, it's a little bit personal, but of course, you know, an iliac DVT, a little bit of bed rest. Um, and I had my twins earlier at, at 35 weeks and had some bleeding complications. But despite all of that, we were fortunate to have healthy twin boys. This is actually a picture of my partner seven days before she delivered. And uh, I think it kind of emphasizes the point of stress on your body and the benefits of robot per, per her latest talk. So whether you live a kid-free life or you have kids, um, I think the next title to emphasize is how to grow your career while taking care of your sick parents. Uh, it's inevitable that our parents uh, will age and succumb to illness, 
and I think that most of us don't realize how this will impact your career. If you don't live close to your parents, this may uh, result in emergent trips and being in medicine. I think we all feel a need uh, to weigh in professionally, and our family members expect us to weigh in professionally, as well as physically and emotionally, and not to mention a lot of other issues that come along down the road with aging parents. So I think it's also important to expect the unexpected. Um, the next title would be How to Grow Your Career While Facing Personal Health Challenges. Um, this is my fabulous partner, Andy, who's actually given this talk before, who I admire very much. Um, he himself and, uh, was diagnosed with testicular cancer, and I witnessed him undergo surgery and toxic chemotherapy. He has been an example not only to me, but to our department on how to prioritize uh, his personal priorities and still be successful at the same time. So we all know life is complex and unpredictable. Everyone is faced with individual challenges. And I think it's important really to have knowledge and, and be able to anticipate these obstacles, which I think will help you better plan and prepare. I also think it's important for surgery departments and residency programs uh, that they no longer view these as one-off cases, but really account for these changes with our workforce and culture and that these types of personal challenges should not penalize individuals in regards to career development and advancement. So for me, I like to go into things eyes wide open. We're surgeons, I always like the worst case scenario, and I think having some of these statistics in mind uh, would have helped me better face some of these challenges in retrospect. I think uh, it's important to know that female physicians with young children spend nine more hours per week on domestic activities. Female physicians are more likely than male physicians to leave academia within the, the first two years. I think the relative risk is pretty high here at six. Female physicians are less likely to advance to full professorships and earn less than their male colleagues. And female physicians are more likely to divorce with an odds ratio of 1.5 compared to their male colleagues. And finally, as I previously emphasized, it's pretty high. A third of female surgeons are gonna face issues with fertility. So this is a picture of my best friend from surgical residency. Uh, she's a thoracic surgeon, and she's with her HPB surgeon husband with their three kids under the age of five. Uh, she also uh, struggled with infertility and devastatingly lost a set of twins at 24 weeks. Um, she published this study, which I think is interesting. It involved more than 120 faculty members, more than 100 residents at her academic institution. Um, what the study showed is that Men tended to be uh, more likely to be married. But when women are married, they tend to be more likely to be married to a professional that works full time. And that, like you saw in the previous studies, we tend to put off our uh, childbearing due to our careers. The female surgeons also compared to the male surgeons um, kind of deal with the brunt of the daily household activities and child activities with the exception of monthly bill payment and financial planning. I don't think this is unique to surgeons. You know, I think you know, a lot of other careers this is the case, but I think that the impact is higher given the demands of our career and the longer duration of our training. This is an article that was published in the New York Times um, shortly after a longitudinal cohort study was performed in uh, training physicians. And basically what they found is that women experience a greater increased risk in depressive symptoms. And this is uh, attributed to uh, work-family conflict. And when this is uh, controlled for, that uh, depressive symptoms are reduced by more than a third. So basically with systematic uh, modifications that alleviate this conflict between work and family life, overall female health for physicians improve, which is absolutely no surprise. So how do we set ourselves up uh, for success given all of these challenges? Well, I think it's really important that you choose your environment uh, wisely. Uh, it should definitely not be a rushed decision and, ba and should not be based on location and salary, that you really want to find role models within your environment that you respect and that do a good job themselves with career and family balance. And uh, I think it's important to know that male can be as equally effective role models as females. 
and that having both is optimal, especially uh, given that we're in a male-dominated uh, career. Uh, also, I think it's important to really know the culture uh, of your institution and the policies that are in place. Are your colleagues going to be collaborative? Uh, do they want, do they have the same goals? So if you're wanting to establish a, a program, you're interested in research and optimizing education and patient protocols, is this important to your colleagues? Because if it's not, it's going to be a lot harder to achieve alone. And uh, taking in consideration the above points, if it's possible, geographically living near family and friends uh, can make all the difference. But I, I don't think that should be the first priority. This is a picture of all the female colleagues, uh, surgeon colleagues in my department. They come in all flavors, whether they're single, dual professional moms, uh, whether they're single moms, whether they're a, a professional mom with a non-working spouse or partner. And I will say they've been an example to me over the years and I've learned a great deal from them. Uh, actually, one of our male colleagues uh, posted this picture to celebrate National Women Physician Day. And I've been very fortunate to have both female and male role models. Uh, following my fellowship, I was hired on at the University of Washington. I remember being stressed out sitting in Brant Oschlager's office and worrying about promotion my first year on. And he told me what Dr. Carlos Pellegrini told him, which is really to find a niche and be passionate about it when you do find that niche, as opportunities will come from that passion alone and uh, establishing your niche. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, Brant Oschlager and his wife, Anne Marie, who's an academic surgeon, have served as an example uh, to me over the years. Uh, they do a fantastic job of balancing their professional life and uh, family lives. And as you can see, it's uh, Dr. Wright again, uh, again being an example to our department uh, on how to be successful, yet placing uh, personal priorities when important above your career. So again, just to emphasize kind of uh, along the lines of Dr. Salas' talk is really find a niche, be passionate about it. And uh, if you really want to be successful, like Dr. Pappas told us during our, uh, when we were surgical residents, is to find a niche that no one likes. Um, this is not the case with me. I was charged with um, finding a, a niche which was specifically establishing a hernia center my first year on faculty. Uh, you really got to dive in give talks to neighborhood, neighborhood clinics, join local societies, give grand rounds, teach the nurses on the units, develop preoperative and pro postoperative protocols, and uh, following program development, the residents will seek you out along with the medical students. You'll have opportunity to optimize their educational experience. Research opportunities will then follow, and eventually leadership opportunities. So I also want to emphasize how important it is as it goes hand in hand to, again, uh, be active locally and also join uh, societies on a national level. Don't spread yourself thin. Be selective. Join the ones that you really like and that you really benefit from attending their annual meetings. And when you do join these societies, delve in. Join committees. Join committees that align with your professional and personal interests and start early. Join as a candidate member if you're a resident. And uh, I want to emphasize, bring your family if it's feasible. I mean, it really hasn't been feasible for me until I think more recently. And it's been really, really refreshing to see surgeons show up with children and get them involved. I've been to two society meetings over the last month, and I've seen a lot of young adults and teenagers kind of uh, be involved. And I think it's very, very be beneficial for them to see what we do. So I also want to emphasize, you really want to learn from others. Uh, when I was Dr. Pryor's uh, surgical resident at Duke, being the great mentor that she was, she encouraged me to attend a career development seminar, which I think uh, Dr. Stephanidis was also faculty at the time in Florida. And from that, I became turned on to SAGES. I was able to get involved with the committee early on and really dived into projects that I was passionate about. And this has led to a multitude of opportunities within state stages that I've been very grateful for. I've been able to develop a network of friends that I view as a second family. And I want to emphasize also that having an example and role model, Dr. Pryor was the first 
woman at Duke to have not one child, but two child children during her uh, surgical residency. And I think it's, it's folks like this that uh, really promote our careers and, and really guide us and help us better balance our career with our per personal lives. I feel somewhat old because her youngest child that we used to round on on the weekends when I was a surgical resident is now off to college and will be attending Duke in the fall. So in conclusion, balance is kind of a unique concept. It's not like you find it and you're done. It's dynamic and you're always trying to achieve it. I think it's important to increase your knowledge about potential relevant barriers so that you better can navigate, plan, and prepare. I think uh, choosing the right environment is paramount and you really should spend some time really getting to know the culture and colleagues before signing on the line. And also it is really important to find a niche and establish yourself and be passionate about it. And then align your clinical interests with education, research, and leadership goals and also get involved locally and nationally and do so early on. And finally, realize that outsourcing helps, but it's not everything. You can't pay uh, other people to live your lives, nor would you want to. I really believe that multitasking is a true talent, but I tell you, I don't think it's always a great thing. I think it interferes with our ability to focus and really live in the moment. And I think that uh, prioritizing your mental and personal health is important so that you can take better care of others. And be honest with yourself. What, what is truly important to you in regards to your career and personal priorities? And also, don't be afraid to ask your colleagues for help. They've, we've all been chased, uh, faced with unique challenges. Not only will they offer to cover for you, but can help you navigate uh, through the, the rough times. And also, reciprocate the effort. Don't be rigid, be flexible. We like to think we're in control, but we're not. And, and have a sense of humor. Thank you.